surround me with songs of deliverance. Amen? Yeah. Aren't you thankful for that? We are free in Jesus. So look, I want you to say this. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am free. Now, there's this part in this song, at least about three times or so in this song, that we sing this. Give me that key. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I am free. Okay, so look. When we get to that part, hallelujah, I want you to say and shout, hallelujah. hallelujah. You can practice right now. Hallelujah. hallelujah. There we go. All right. And then I am free. All right, now we can go to ball games and we can shout for our favorite players and at the refs who give a bad call in our kids' soccer game and all that great stuff. But how much more can we lift up the name of Jesus who has set us free? Amen? Amen. All right. Let's lift up the name of Jesus. Here we go. burning a lot of dead and learning stone walls I built up trapped by the way I'm living I don't want to be a prisoner I don't want to be a prisoner we'll sing a song of deliverance I will lift my hands and drop these chains walk out free in my mind, I immediately thought, it's amazing what Jesus can do. 
and I said it aloud right then. I said, it's amazing what Jesus Christ can do. Listen to me, if you came in this morning and you're bound up, you got these chains that are on my arm, let me tell you what, Jesus breaks chains. He sets people free. And it doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been. If you think it's too much, cast it upon him. Throw it upon him. If it's so heavy, you just got to drop it on him. And you're going to be set free today. Can we lift up the name of Jesus again, guys? Absolutely. Well, it is so awesome to have you all here this morning. My name's Tommy. I'm one of the pastors here at Exalt Church. And we're so glad that you joined us. I don't know if you know from this worship here, we're going to make it very easy. We just need you to lift up Jesus with us, guys. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, oh, I believe that you are my fortress and you are my portion. You are my hiding place, oh, and I believe you are the way, the truth, and the life, oh, and I believe you are the way, oh, the truth, and the life. Set on you, and you meet me here today with mercies that are new. All my fears and doubts, they can all come to because they can't stay alone when I'm here with you. And it's a new horizon, and I'm set on. Nothing can 
Jesus is still here and he is worthy. Amen. I count on one thing. The same God who never fails. He will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never made. He's working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, in the yes, I will lift you high in the lowest of valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, and the yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy and all my days. Oh, yes, go back, sing that first verse one more time. Oh. Because I want you to realize you can count on Jesus no matter what is happening. Amen. Oh, yes. And I count on one thing. The same God who never fails, he will not fail me now. Oh, you won't fail me now in the way. The same God who's never made. He's working all things out. You're working all things. Come on, sing it out. Oh, and yes, I will lift you high in the lowest of valley. And yes, I will. I bless your name, Lord. Oh, and yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy and all. For all my days, come on! Oh yes, I will, and I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names, and nothing can stand again. And I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names, and nothing can stand. To glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against, and I choose to praise. To glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against. Oh, and yes, I will lift you high in the Lord. The valley, yes, I will. I bless your name, Lord. Oh, and the yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy and all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. Come on, can you give Jesus praise? Yes, we worship your name, Lord. We praise you.
chains are gone my debt is paid from death to life in grace to
Come on for Jesus, yes. Praise your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Look at somebody beside you and say, in Jesus, I am free. And I'm glad you're here. Amen. Give high fives. You may be seated. Amen. Absolutely. It is so awesome to have you guys with us this morning. I would be amiss if I did not bring up, was last week not an awesome time celebrating? Absolutely. It was great to see you guys at the cookout right across the street. What a wonderful time to see everybody hang out, and what an awesome turnout. It was great to celebrate freedom with you guys. Awesome, awesome. Um, if you are a first-time guest, we are so glad that you are with us this morning. You know what I love about this church? You know, in the Bible, in Mark 4 and 21, Jesus said, as a lamp is brought in, it does not get put under a basket or under a bed. I had already planned on saying this, but then Pastor Roger handed me these awesome stickers. And this is what I love about this church. You don't take the good news that you hear here and keep it in here. No, no. You choose to put it in your windows and on your dashboards and in your offices and in your schools. And this morning, we're going to help you out with doing that. There are some brand new stickers out on the entry table. Make sure you guys grab these. These are really, really cool. You can put them um, you know, on your window. You can put them on your car. And when Roger handed them to me, I was like, I, I can't put that on my car. So he let me know. We now have magnets. So if you're anything like me, maybe, okay, they might call it a little heavy-footed, and uh, you decide to go 20, well, not 20 over the speed limit, maybe 15, okay, 10, 5. 5 over the speed limit, you just pull this off the door and put it back on your dash, and then when you come back to normal operating speed, put it back. So if you're anything like myself or Pastor Roger Pate, we encourage you to grab a magnet. Either way, grab some out on the entry table. It's so awesome to have those things. And also, like I said, the thing I love about this church is you don't keep the good news to yourself. You spread it everywhere you go. Give yourself a round of applause for that, guys. <laughs> this morning, I got to let you know that up to this point, it's been a fully family-friendly service. And I'm sad to say today that ends. <laughs> No, I'm not sad to say it. It's awesome. It's absolutely awesome. The Exalt Nursery is open for your little littles. My Liam is down there. Cannot wait to see your other little littles. But today, what starts today? Uh, let me think. Exalt Bible Camp starts today. Absolutely. A big round of applause. We've been talking about this week after week, and the day has finally come. So July and, and August, Exalt Bible Camp is going on for preschool through uh, fifth grade. So if you have preschool through fifth graders and you have your registration badge, if you can head back to the back to these awesome volunteers with the big exalt signs, head on back. And if you are preschool through fifth grade and you don't have a registration card, parents head back there with your kiddos. We'll get them registered. And while you're enjoying the message of Jesus Christ in service, they'll be getting the message of Jesus Christ right down the hall. So July and August... Exalt Bible Camp. We're so excited for this time. Let your friends know that that's going on here at Exalt Church. From there, a little out of, or, uh, out of order, but always, if you're a first-time guest, whether you're joining us here in service or online, go to exaltchurch.com. If you could click on the drop-down tab and click on the connect card. Take time to let us know that you were here today. And what are we going to do? We're going to reach out and say thank you for trusting us with your time. So please take time and do that for us today. Also, if you've been coming to Exalt Church for a while and maybe some of your information had changed, this is the perfect place to update your information. So go to exaltchurch.com, collect on, uh, click on the connect card, and go ahead and fill that out for us. Thank you guys for joining us and enjoy the rest of the service. Man, I think we had an awesome time at the cookout last week, didn't you guys? Yeah. Praise God for that. Go ahead and mark your calendars the Sunday of Labor Day, that Sunday before Labor Day. We're going to do it all over again, all right? So plan on that, that Sunday of Labor Day. 
we're, we, we're, this is kind of in the works. We're also, uh, I can't confirm this yet, we're going to try to pull off a baptism too, if we can pull that off during that time. There's some, there's some water issues there. We're going to try to pull it off. Tommy, my logistics guy, is saying he can pull it off. So, so we'll be giving you more information on that as well. Awesome, guys. I'm so excited to be here today. God is working. I'm also excited about uh, having the kids' ministry fully up and functioning again, aren't you? Really glad about that. Let me say this. Um, it takes people to do that. And so if you have a heart or a calling uh, or maybe you realize there's a need there and you want to help fi fi uh, serve in that area, uh, the kids' ministry would welcome you open arm to come and help them make an impact on the next generation. Why I believe in children's ministry so much, it was because at eight years old, I met Jesus Christ in children's ministry. I've told you many times I grew up in a family where my, my dad wasn't a believer and mom took us to church as a single parent. I met Jesus at age eight. At age nine, it was in kids' ministry that God called me to become a preacher of the gospel, and I haven't looked back since, all right? So it's not just babysitting back there. Uh, kids' lives are being absolutely transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's jump into I want to talk to you today about five everyday ways to love others and change the world. We began this series a couple weeks ago, and we're going to wrap it up today. Uh, today. But I want to give you five everyday ways to love others and change the world. Let's look at Jesus Christ's mission, first of all. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, it says that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Now, the word lost is a heavy word. It means something is valuable. You, know, you don't lose things that aren't valuable. And so mankind was lost, and Jesus came to seek and save a very valuable and lost humanity. Listen, if you see people as projects, you don't see them as lost. If you see people as landscape, they're just in the background. We don't see them as valuable if they're landscape. What's a landscape person? It's the people that drive on the highway with us. We see them as landscape. They're the people that walk around Target as you and I are walking. They're just landscape. You really don't see them. If we see people as vending machines, what's a vending machine? We, we see the waiter or the waitress or the barista at Starbucks as a vending machine. And all they're there for, we, we see the Instacart delivery driver. We see the Uber driver as simply as a vending machine distributing to us what we pay them to do. We see them as machines. We won't engage with them as lost because we only see them as an ends to meeting our means, or a means, rather, to meeting our end. However, Jesus saw people as lost, and he had a simple strategy of befriending people and then blessing those same people. And then Jesus Christ, who had the mission of seeking and save the lost, he looks at you and I, and he says, I, I want to give you the same mission. Look at Mark chapter 12 and verse 30 and verse 31. And, and we believe in the mission of Jesus Christ so much that it's become our mission statement to honor God and to help people. Th those aren't just words. We really do here want to honor God and help people. Do we do it perfectly? Absolutely not. But is that our DNA? It is. Is that what we want to live up for and strive for? That's what we want to live up and strive for. And, and here is what Jesus said. He said, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's the honor God part. Honor God. And then he goes on and he says, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Who, who is your neighbor? I, I think we want to make this really super spiritual. But who is your neighbor? Oh, we say everybody's our neighbor. When we say everybody's our neighbor, here's what happens. We, we, we don't focus on anyone. When we say everyone's our neighbor, then we don't focus on anyone. L let, me, let me break it down to you. Your neighbor is the person who lives next door to you. Your neighbor is the person that you work with. Your neighbor is the person who lives in your house. Your neighbor is that ex-brother-in-law. Your neighbor 
is that person that you know. And listen, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I've had some great neighbors, and I've had some not-so-great neighbors. How about you? I've had neighbors that have been easy to love, and I've had some neighbors that have been hard to love, and maybe some I am still learning to love. How about you? Can we be real? Oh, don't go there. It's videotape, Roger. All right. But listen, and I realized one day I was living in a, in, in a neighborhood once upon a time when I realized very quickly that my unbelieving neighbors were actually better neighbors than this Christian neighbor. And I realized, you know what? If I have the hope and the light of the world in me, I better be doing at least what my unsaved neighbors are doing. And I was convicted to make a difference in my own neighborhood, in my previous neighborhood. When I looked out and saw my unbeliever neighborhood out there shoveling the walks of the old people in my neighborhood, and I wasn't doing it, I was convicted at my core. And guess what happened? I went in Virginia and bought a shovel. And I was helping them as well. Here's the point. Love your neighbor as yourself. I, I want to talk to you a little bit about having the faith conversation, having the spiritual conversation, sharing your testimony, uh, inviting someone else to church. And I want to give you five easy ways to do that. I want to make it really practical. And we put it in the acronym of BLESS. Five ways to bless others. The B stands for begin with prayer. Listen, prayer is the work. Prayer is the work. Prayer is what changes the hearts. If we do what we do here as a church without prayer, we're just doing it in the power of our flesh. If we're trying to share Jesus Christ with others without prayer, we're doing it in the power of our own abilities. And the only way that a heart is going to be changed, the only way that someone is going to be born again, the only way that someone's marriage is going to be healed, the only way that someone's lost teenager is going to be found is when we truly pray. And I'm not talking about that Christian uh, phraseology we use, you're in my thoughts and my prayers. If I'm in your thoughts and your prayers, please take me off your thoughts and prayer list because all you're saying is, I'm thinking about you. So if you're thinking about me, just tell me, drop, drop the Christian jargon and say, hey, Raj, I'm thinking about you. Because when you're thinking about me, I'm not expecting and depending upon your prayers. But when you say you're praying for me, I am desperately depending upon your prayers. I had an old saint once tell me that she never went to bed without her mentioning the name of her children once before the throne room of God. She said it didn't always have to be long, but she said I would call Johnny and Ronnie and Tony and Sarah before God's name, just calling their names out. Prayer is how I discover the mission, and it's how I do the mission. Before Jesus ever called the 12 apostles, the Bible says that he prayed that night. The L stands for listen, and this is a lost ability in our culture. It's a lost ability in my life as well, the ability to listen. We're so convinced that we want to get the message out. We're, we're so ready to give back the reply on social media and Twitter. We're so easy to want to clap back so fast that, that we have lost the ability to really, really listen. How our churches would be different if we listen. How our relationships would be different if we listen. How my marriage would be different if I became a better listener. But I'm a talker. I married a talker. When we were dating, someone said, how do you stand each other? You're both a bunch of talkers. And Laura says, it works. It does work. Actually, she's a better listener than I am, and that's probably why it works. But what would happen if, like Jesus, we began to listen? Have you ever gone back and just studied the stories of Jesus when he healed someone or listened to their story? He listened before he gave a prescription. 
listen, and I talked about that at Lent two weeks ago, so if you want to catch that online on YouTube at Exalt Church VA, you can do that. And the third thing is eat. This doesn't sound really spiritual. This doesn't sound like a real key to witnessing. Can I tell you, however, that one of the best ways you will witness some, with someone is to eat with them? That the number one way that you will build an acquaintance to a relationship is to eat with them? Think about how you got to know your spouse. How many times did you eat with them before you kissed them for the first time? How many times did you eat with them before you got down on your knee, guy, and said, hey, I can't live my life without you. Will you marry me? How many meals did you have with her before you flew out to ask her parents for their blessing? And he lectured you about being a pastor. <laughs> True story. How, how many times have you ate with them before you had? Think about your closest relationships. It's going to involve coffee. It's going to involve, involve food. In fact, when you study the ancient cultures of the Bible, of the ancient Near East, and actually many cultures today, you realize there is something special, may I dare say something supernatural, about having a meal together. Now, in, our, in the church today, we give you a piece of bread and we give you a little grape juice because I have so many recovering folks here, I can't give you the real stuff, so we, we give you the grape juice, amen. Amen. That's true. Amen. Pray. Someone shout yes. yes. And so he gave that to you. But he realized that was actually a real meal? That they actually ate together in a Passover meal? We do it as a symbolism of let's have a piece of bread and let's have a, a, a glass of grape juice. What we did last week was more what communion was than when we give you the grape juice and the piece of bread. Because why do we eat together out there last week? We ate together, not because it was a national holiday. We ate because you could have done that with your family. We ate together because we were the church triumphant coming together to eat together and fellowship together. And so here's where when we eat. And when you read the story of the Bible, Jesus Christ was constantly eating with lost people. I think about an atheist that I had coffee with that came back to Jesus Christ. And how did that happen? It was over, not in my Bible study, not sitting in my office. It was having a cup of coffee at a Panera Bread talking about Jesus Christ. I think about my Muslim friend from Bangladesh and how many times uh, we would eat together and the conversation would turn to Jesus Christ and we would talk about Jesus, not, and it wasn't even forced, it just happened that way and I didn't even have to bow my head and pray a preacher's prayer over my favorite Irish food from McDonald's. You know, I, I was just able to talk and, and actually many times I didn't even pray over my meal with him. But the conversation would go to Jesus, and today he's a follower of Christ. Did he get saved through me having lunch with him? No, but we had so many conversations about Jesus that later on, someone else reaped where someone else planted and someone else watered. So think about the lost art of, of having people in our homes. In fact, I, I mentioned it last week, and I don't want to be legalistic about it, but when Paul gives the requirements for a bishop, Episcopos in the Greek language. We get the church episcopal from it. Episcopos, pastor, bishop, elder. He says this person needs to be hospitable. This person needs to keep an open house. This person needs to invite people into their home. Why? Something supernaturally spiritual can happen. When you sit down and you share a meal with someone. It's amazing to me that when we have donuts out here, and we haven't had donuts since COVID or, or whatever, it's amazing to me how people disarm when they have a cup of coffee in one hand and a fattening bagel in the other. It's amazing the conversation that happens when you're at the beach and they're holding a beer in their hand. Why is that? 
There's something that happens when we choose to enter into relationships. And, and what I do miss uh, in our lives, before we were pastoring, we used to have the, the uh, Thanksgiving dinner at our home every year. And, and we haven't been able to do this in recent years because, to be honest with you, our, our lives have so been so busy around the church. But we had those moments when in our Thanksgiving meal, we would look for people to invite who had no place to go, who were not believers. One year we had a Jewish woman in our home, sitting beside a Muslim woman in our home, sitting beside a Russian in our home, sitting right beside a retired naval uh, enlisted gentleman. Uh, uh, and then we, we, we had several folks there, and it was amazing that in that environment, how he plants seeds in people's lives, some of those folks we still have great relationships with. And how did it start? One of those couples, it started by saying, come over for Thanksgiving. Do you have any place to go? No, we have no place to go. Come over. And Laura was smart. We didn't preach the gospel to them. I didn't give them the, the five-point Roman road plan. But Laura would put on the, on the note cards, hey, list something you're thankful for. And guess who came up during that thankful moment? Jesus. It was a seed. It was planted. I, I, I share that with you because sometimes we think evangelism has to be the guy with the megaphone in Williamsburg when you're trying to watch the fireworks and he's screaming about Jesus to you. Oftentimes we, we, we think that the, the witnessing has to be on the church calendar. Can I tell you that the most powerful Witnessing moments you're going to have are going to happen when you were organically living your life and through relationship, it happens. Because when you have relationship, what's going to happen is someone is going through, going through a rough time. And do you realize that there are key moments in people's lives when they are seeking the truth? One of them is after the birth of a brand new baby. Your friends that just had a brand new baby, they're more open to the gospel than many other people. Why? Because they're coming to that point in time is how are we going to raise our children? What are we going to teach them? Eat with them. Have them to your home. If you don't have a robot vacuum cleaner, take them to Starbucks. And I joke about that, but let me say this. Get rid of the idolatry that your house has to be perfect before you can have someone in your home. That's idolatry. Listen to me. That, listen, that's idolatry that's keeping you from spreading the gospel. Wasn't the worship band awesome today? <laughs> Some of you are thinking, I wish they would have stayed up here and not you preaching at me, Pastor. Let's go on to the S. Let's wrap this message up. S, serve. Matthew 20 and verse 28 says this, even the Son of Man, and I love the fact that Jesus chose this term, the Son of Man. Why did Jesus use the term son of man? It's taken from the book of Daniel chapter 7 that talks about this ap apocalyptic figure who is the son of man. And the reason why he used it was because, one, it wasn't so full of all of the political jargon of the day. In Jesus' day, they was always trying to pull him into some political camp. And so he had Pharisees trying to pull him into this camp. He had Herodians trying to pull him into this camp. And people called him son of David. And the term son of David was a very politically charged statement that spoke about the Jewish Messiah. And they wanted to keep the Jewish Messiah to the Jews. Go back and study your Bible. Look about how that the Jewish people wanted to keep the Jesus to themselves. They wanted to keep the Messiah to themselves. And Jesus, going back to the Old Testament, always had the plan of taking the message of God's deliverance to the entire world. It's not in the notes. Let's go there. Compare the promise to Abraham to the great commission of Jesus Christ. God told Abraham, I will bless you and through you 
all the nations of the world will be blessed. And he talks about how he was going to make Abraham a, a, a priest to the nations. Think about Abraham for just a moment. Abraham was an Iraqi. And God made him his first Israelite. And he says, listen, through you all the nations will be blessed. God chose a Gentile, made him his man, and he set up a missionary nation, Israel, to go forth and spread the missionary message about the gospel, which is our God, Yahweh, reigns. That was the message. That Yahweh is the real God. That Yahweh is the true God. That Yahweh rules and reigns forever. That's what they were to proclaim, and they failed. They were God's chosen people because they were chosen to spread the message of God. That's what they were chosen to do. Take the politicalness out of it. That was their mission, to spread the message of Jesus, of God. And then we compare that, I will bless you and make your name great, and through you the nations will be blessed. And what does Jesus say in Matthew to the most Jewish biography that we have in, the, in, the, in the, the New Testament. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples of the nations. Very similar lingo there. Jesus came, the Son of Man came. He stepped out of the political argument, and he said, listen, I am not going to win this argument politically. I'm not after the political power. I'm after the heart. If I can change the heart, if I can change the heart and save the person. So the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many people. Jesus knew that when you serve others in a tangible way, this demonstrates the love of God to others. And serving doesn't have to be a big thing. It may be shoveling the snow walk. It, it may be taking their dumpsters out to the street and bringing them back in. It may be simply dropping off donuts when you, they know they have visitors out of town in coming in. It, it, may, it may be simply just being kind and mowing their lawn. It, it can be catching their dog when their dog gets out and you catch the dog and you hold it for them so the dog doesn't get ran over. You serve people, and you do it in the name of Jesus. You take their shift because you know that they have a special event they have to go to, but they can't get off because they use their time, and you're going to cover it for them. I have seen this happen over and over again. I pastored a church where at one time I could count 50 people that came to salvation in Jesus Christ because on one hot July day on the corner of Sparrow Road and Indian River Road, we handed out cold diet Coca-Colas and diet Pepsis. We had the anointed and the unanointed drinks. Amen. And we handed them out with a card that said, this is a gift to you, no strings attached. We just want you to know that God loves you in a practical way. One of those persons that got the Diet Pepsi came to church the next Sunday, and her nickname became Diet Pepsi. And she came to church, and she thought we were a cult. Some like you think we are right now thought we were a cult. And she wanted to leave, but something kept her there because there was a love there. And she invited this friend who became a believer, who invited this friend that became a believer, who invited this friend that became a believer. Through a diet Pepsi, the Lord works in mysterious ways. Helping people's sugar addiction. One day we got out there, we handed out all of these Krispy Kreme donuts. 
It's like being a sugar pusher. <laughs> and we said, here is a Krispy Kreme donut. We give it to you with no strings attached. And here's what's funny. People would always try to give us money for doing those things. Have you noticed that? You do something kind for someone today and they try to give you money? Don't take it. I give this to you in the name of Jesus. We gave the Krispy Kreme donut and I had one rogue person there that wasn't listening to the rules. He was about 65 years old and he, we told him, do not take any money. Give the donut. And guess what happened? Someone gave him $10 for the building fund, and he took it. And he came over and said, Pastor, 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 they gave us $10 for the building fund. And those that know me well, he got the look. He got the Roger look, and I looked at him, and I said, you took the money? Yeah. I, I, he was persistent. I said, you ruined it. You ruined it. He just bought the donut. What are we going to do with this $10? Took the $10. We prayed over it. And we said, God, what do we do with this $10? This just messed up our plan. We raised our eyes, and there was a barber shop around the corner. And I told my dear beloved friend, he's a great guy, I'm teasing him in the pulpit here, but I said, go. Go over there and pay for the next person's haircut. And he walked into a barber shop, and he says, that was a cheap haircut, I need to go back to that place, amen. <laughs> Got back in there, and he paid for the next person's haircut and said, I'm doing this in the name of Jesus as a gift, no strings attached. Do you know what happened in that barber shop? That barber shop exploded with talking because they had never seen anything like that before. Why? Because when people live like Christians and they live like Christ followers and they serve their world, it's foreign to our world. They don't know how to handle it because it's so countercultural. Because everybody wants something from you. They're selling something. They're pushing something. They're manipulating something. They have an angle. You know how it is. But when you serve them, no strings attached. I'm doing this to give glory to God and because you're valuable and God loves you. You watch what happens. And as the old saint once said that I recently plagiarized in a motivational text moment, I did not mean to, but I did. Preach the gospel. And if necessary, use words. Preach the gospel. And if necessary, use words words. Grab your umbrella sometime when you're at Kroger and the rain is falling on that person. Don't be a creeper. All right? Be wise about it. But grab that umbrella and go and shield them while they're loading their, their stuff into their van. Watch what response you get. Don't wait for the church to organize that and plan that. We will do some servant evangelism things coming in this fall and this next year. But I'm talking about in your everyday organic life. Do you know why churches have programs? We have programs to help you do what you're supposed to do organically. We have small groups because people don't do it organically, although they should. We have outreach days. Why? Because we should be doing that organically. Let me close with the S for story. Tell your story. Can I tell you how much I love to hear your story? Can I tell you how much I love to hear how Jesus Christ has changed your life? Can I tell you how much I like to sit down and have a cup of coffee with you or a Coke and hear you tell me what Jesus Christ has done for you? Here's the reality. Your story is unique. 
Your story is powerful. Your story is effective. Your experience, and I'm not proud of this, but it's true of our day and age, but your experience is valued higher than facts today. Do I like that? No, I really don't because the gospel is factual. The b- gospel can be proven. If you, can't, if you want an answer to a lot of your questions, pick up the book by Lee Strobel called The Case for Faith. And he answers a lot of the questions that people are struggling with their faith. There are so many questions that people have that people have been raising objections for 500 years. Can I say that there's the same objections and they've been answered for 500 years? The faith is factual. But when you start telling your story, on one winter's day this last January, I I had to meet with someone, and uh, I called Pastor Tommy, and I said, I'm going to go meet with someone over a situation. He said, don't go alone. Let me go with you. And I said, come on. And so we rendezvoused in the slush and the snow, and we went to meet with this individual, and we got in there to start sharing the gospel with the person, and I realized I was over my head. I had no experience with what we were doing. And then Tommy, it was like the Holy Spirit came upon him, and Tommy lit up, and he got into Tommy's zone and began to share his story with this person. And can I tell you that sharing that story was powerful? I walked out, I put my arm around him, and I told him, hey, I'm proud of you. But I said, your story is so powerful, and you were able to share something because you understood something that I did not know, and you just made an impact here. I've watched him share his story. I was told by one believer who was, in, again, in his 60s, told me the story of how when he came to faith, he was raised in West Virginia, and as a teenager, he walked into a hardware store, and he stole something. Stole it. Years later in Virginia, he becomes a follower of Christ. Jesus Christ saves his life, and one day he's praying, and God told him, when you go back to West Virginia, I want you to go back in that hardware store. I want you to tell the man what you did and pay today's price for it. He went back to southern West Virginia came by the hardware store, and he told the man, hey, back when I was 15, 16 years old, I forget all the details, he said, I I stole this from you. But he said, since then, I've met Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ has transformed my life. I'm a new creation. I'm not the same man. I'm different now. My life has changed. I'm not that guy anymore, and, and I'm here to pay you for what I stole from you. The guy was dumbfounded. The guy was shocked. The guy did not know what to say, and he began to blubber over his words and said, that's not necessary. You don't have to do it. And he says, oh, it is necessary because my Savior has called me to account for this. i got to make it right. And he left the money on the counter, and the man never took it, and he walked away. Who knows what happened to the money? But you see, it wasn't about the money. It was about a changed life by the gospel that so changed this guy's life that his heart was so sensitive and his life was so open that whatever the master said to do, he went and did and he told his story. And we don't know how the man who owned that shop, we don't know how his story ends. We don't know if he became a believer. We don't know if he was a believer. We don't know. All we know is the story was told. One plants, one waters, God gives the increase, and you don't know what you're doing. You, you think that when you tell the story, you want to reap the harvest. Can I tell you there are going to be people that you are never going to see come to Jesus Christ in your lifetime? but you have planted the seed that someone else waters. Can I tell you, there are some of you folks that have been saved under my ministry that I was able to reap the harvest of grandma's prayers and grandpa's life and some other cantankerous preacher's preaching. And I get to come along and reap the harvest. It's a tag team thing. It's 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 a team ministry. 
Tell your story. Share your story about Jesus. Tell, share your story how Jesus Christ has changed your life. Allow your test to become your testimony. Allow your test to become your testimony. What does it say in 2 Corinthians chapter 1? It's not in the notes, but I, I want you to go there. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3. Listen to these words. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction. Why? So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Here's the point. God does not waste anything. He doesn't waste your breakup. He doesn't waste your divorce. He doesn't waste the loss of your child. He do Listen, I'm not throwing that stuff out loosely. Your story is too sacred for me to throw that out loosely. I've heard you cry and talk about how you had the miscarriage and how you questioned God and how it broke you. I've heard you bury loved ones too early. That's sacred. That's intimate. I hold it to my heart. But God holds it even closer. And God doesn't waste it. And the very comfort he has given you in your affliction. There's going to be a day you're going to meet someone in the exact same location you find yourself today. And you're going to be uniquely gifted and uniquely shaped and uniquely called and uniquely ready to share the message of hope. Because the comfort you received in your brokenness you can now share into their brokenness your scar God's going to use your test is going to become your testimony the struggle you're having in your marriage right now the test one day I believe God is going to be a time where you're going to stand up and you're going to share the story openly and honestly with other people of how Jesus Christ transformed your life your addiction that you thought was going to bury you and kill you and kill your marriage and take your kids from you, you're going to stand one day and you're going to talk to someone else in that very same addiction and you're going to give them a hope that they've never had. Your sickness that you're wondering why God hasn't healed me and does God heal today? Absolutely God heals today. Does God heal everyone? No, I wish he did. There's an ultimate healing of heaven. We know that. While you're alive, why pray for your healing? Every single day I'll pray for your healing. But can I tell you that your brokenness and your sickness might be something that God uses? Your weakness that you think is your weakest moment is actually God's greatest strength in your life. God loves to use people with limps. And as I stand here and I say this today, I want to say to you again, Roger Pate doesn't have it all together. I fail every single day of my life. There's some things I'm a champ in. There's some things I feel like I have it together. And then you talk to my mother-in-law and she'll tell you the real story. All right, in the front row right here. Listen, there are some things. But can I tell you, I've had my tests can I tell you I've had my broken moments? Can I tell you I've had my sinful moments? Can I tell you I've had the scars, the battle wounds to show you? Can I tell you I've cried the tears that no one else saw? Can I tell you I've prayed the prayers that no one else knew I've prayed? And some of those things will never come out in the light of day on this platform. but I get you with coffee and I hear your story and I feel the Holy Spirit come upon me and I start telling you the testimony of my test and he
here is what God has brought me through, and here is what I saw, and here is where I thought my life was over, and here is where I thought there was no hope left, and here is where I wanted to hang myself, and here is where I wanted to overdose and die, and here is where I wanted to walk away from God forever. And here is where I had no hope and no single friend, it seemed. But God was faithful, and God was good, and God was trustworthy, and I stand upon this mountain this day to declare he is good. Amen. Your story, you didn't have the abortion. It's your story. Can I tell you how many Christian girls in Christian organizations have the abortion because Christian mom and dad say, we don't want the church to talk, so let's keep it quiet and silent? Can I tell you how many conversations I've had like that as a pastor over 30 years? But you kept her. You kept him. And now... You're not some mean protester standing in front of a clinic holding a sign that God hates you. No, you've walked it through. You've gone through the test. The test has become your testimony. And you've said as a single mom, I've walked this through. I have done this through. And, and maybe, maybe you're the one that you didn't have the child. And you did something that you don't even dare speak out loud because you're so ashamed of what you've done. That's a story that God can now use to stop someone else from sharing that same story. To share, this is what happened in my life. Do not do it. Amen? Share your story. Share Jesus and wow, I am out of time. But let me close with this thought. I believe in apologetics. What's apologetics? It's the study of arguing the scripture logically. There are some great guys out there, Ray Comfort. I know that uh, our he-man for Jesus, Patrick, uses a lot of Ray Comfort when they're out doing street ministry, and they do an excellent job doing street ministry. They're going out about once a month. If you want to go out and share the gospel, uh, just, I mean, without a parachute, I mean, look out. I've got some stories. One guy was out there. It cost him 100 bucks. Yeah, a guy went out there to share the gospel, and one guy looked at him and said, in fact, I'm going to tell you who it was. It was Matt Hampton back here. Wave at me, Matt. I'm going to tell your story. Matt went out with Patrick, and he was sharing the gospel with someone, and they looked at him and said, if you really believe this, give me a hundred bucks. And Matt was smart. He's like me. He doesn't carry a hundred bucks on him. He doesn't carry a wallet. And Matt said, ha ha, I don't have a hundred dollars with me. And the guy said, then mow it to me. <laughs> and Matt then mowed a hundred dollars to the guy. The man looked at him and says, well, I guess you are the real deal. I guess you are good. And Matt said, quote, I may not get the quote exact, unquote. Roger paraphrase quote. <laughs> says to the man, I am not good. I need a savior. And you're not good because you just manipulated me to do this. But Jesus is good. And Matt told me over coffee, awesome things happen over coffee. He said, now I got the guy's name in my phone, and I pray for him every day. Mario, 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 we claim your life for Jesus Christ and what you meant to manipulate Matt. We ask for his salvation, Lord, for Mario. Matt, I still remember his name. I pray for him weekly. Amen. For Mario to come to Jesus. You lost $100. He's going to lose his soul to Satan, and Jesus is going to find his soul. Amen. I believe it. I believe it. Amen. Share your story. Serve. Listen. Begin with prayer. And I'm missing one in there, but you go find it and tell me after church what I missed. Stand with me, if you will. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we pause here.
And you told Abraham that you would bless him to be a blessing. Lord, you have preserved Exalt Church. You've blessed us. But Lord, we don't want to hoard the blessing. Bless us to be a blessing. Test us to bring forth a testimony. God, I'm sorry where I have not been Superman for Jesus at times. I'm sorry, God, for the moments that I haven't shared you with those that you brought into my life. I've done that too, Lord. God, I'm sorry for the times I've been ashamed of my story. Who wants to hear the story of a kid preacher? But Lord, this day, I confess on behalf of myself and everyone here, Lord, you have rose them up. You have lifted them up and you waste nothing. Don't waste their hurt. Don't waste their experience. Don't waste their education. Don't waste their family drama. Don't waste, God, the mistakes they have made, the poor decisions. Don't waste the good decisions, Lord. Don't waste the promotion. Don't waste the demotion. God, don't waste the COVID pandemic. Use it for your glory. I pray for every one of their lost children that they would come to faith in Jesus Christ. For their lost parents that they would come to faith in Jesus Christ. Bring someone that they will listen to to hear the gospel, I pray. Amen. And amen. And amen. Amen. Someone say yes to that. Tommy is not going to come receive the offering today. In September, we'll start passing a bucket again come September. That's coming, so get ready in September for it. If you want to give online, go to exaltchurch.com. The giving tab's there. Go there. But something was prompted in my heart when I was praying for your children. And it's simply this. In our Western world, we make faith very easy individual and very personal which it is very personal and individual absolutely but mom dad I want to give you hope your child grown child is running from God like crazy and you cannot reach him it seems let me give you a hint of God's working in their lives God's working in their lives because he worked in your life. And with you, he's made you a bulkhead. He has claimed your soul and he has marked you for God's glory. And listen, what does God often do? He picks a man and he impacts a family that impacts a community, that impacts a world you don't think God's working in his life. Is God working in your life? He is. And there'll be a day, I believe, that just as God claimed Abraham and said, through you, I'm going to bless the nations. God's going to work in your life, not just to save you, but to invade your entire family household. Amen for Jesus. I tell my unbelieving brothers all the time, I'm praying for you. I tell my nieces and nephews, I'm praying for you. I tell them, I call them, I send them texts that will be a weird test. I hope you caught, caught a lot of fish out there, nephew, on your new boat that didn't sink. By the way, I'm praying for you to come meet Jesus. Amen. I love you. I like that. You know, or hey, just something, just something fast. Because you know what? God's working in my life. He's working in Laura's life. And I believe by the very fact he's made a bulkhead into my life, he says, Roger, I want your family. So I serve them notice that God is chasing them down. If God has chased you down and captured you, look out.
he's also pursuing your kids. Look and see what he does. That's for someone I share that with you. If you want to debate theology afterwards about it, not going to do it, all right? I've got my proof text. I can show it to you in the proof text, but that's a little bit my Presbyterian coming out. I'll be quite open with you right that, okay? God bless you guys. Have a great week. God bless you. Amen.